Have you ever recorded something and listened back only to realize there was a problem with your audio levels? I think it's a scientific fact that there are two types of people when it comes to audio production. Those who have messed up their levels and dirty, rotten, lying liars who have also messed up their levels because it happens to all of us. But fortunately, there is a way to help it happen less, so let's talk about the Zoom F2 and how it immediately helped level up my audio levels quality. To cut right to the chase, this has been one of the most awesome and practical pieces of audio equipment I've ever purchased, and this is not sponsored. I did buy this myself from this spunky little startup company that's named after a rainforest. But as much as I'm going to be talking about the Zoom F2 today, when it comes to 32-bit float audio, there are a ton of recorders and interfaces and devices that have 32-bit float audio. So everything to do, all the bits to do with 32 bits, will apply to any of those devices. And then some of the more specific like features and things will apply specifically to the Zoom F2. And you have been listening to me on the Zoom F2 and my disclaimer will be to try to do your best to not judge the mic quality, but the quality of the levels and the audio signal. And the reason I say that is because lavalier mics are a huge area of weakness for me and I've been trying really hard to get better with that. Try not to pay too much attention to the quality of the microphone. I am using the Rode Lavalier 2 if you're curious, but pay attention to the quality of the audio signal because that is what the Zoom F2 and 32-bit float are bringing. If you are more skilled with lavalier microphones, you're using better equipment than I am, then you'll get a better sound than I'm getting, probably. Basically, any shortcomings are my fault and not the equipment's fault is, is the way to look at it. So while there are a whole bunch of different interfaces out there that have 32-bit float audio, when it comes to the F2 specifically, the things I liked about it were the relatively low price, the super small form factor, the super simple interface, Basically, all of those things made me want to not say F U to the F2. I'm really sorry about that joke. The MSRP is $179 for this version, which has Bluetooth. There are a couple other versions. There's a non-Bluetooth version, which is a little less, and there's also a version that comes with a microphone. So you'll kind of go up and down in price a little bit, but for the basic Bluetooth recorder, the MSRP is 179. And since it's not a brand new device, it's been out for a while, it does go on sale pretty often. So you might be able to find it for even a cheaper price. I do like the Bluetooth version because there is a pretty basic Zoom app that goes with the F2. And even though I don't use the app that often, it is a helpful thing to have. Well, before we talk about any of that, let's talk about batteries because my batteries just died, which is the first time I've changed this in November, December, two months that I've had it. You're listening to the Sennheiser MKH50 right now. The batteries, the AAA batteries, are supposed to last up to 14 hours. So I guess I've been using this for about 14 hours now. We're gonna stick with the Sennheiser right now while I talk about the app so I can show you all the features there are. And it's pretty simple. You get basic info about the recorder. My new batteries aren't fully charged, obviously. You can adjust your output volume because there is a 3.5 millimeter output jack. So if you wanna monitor with headphones, you can adjust that here. You can play back things, mark things, start, stop recording from here which is really nice if you have this on somebody or on something and it's far away from you, you can start and stop recording. You can enable hold. There is a very basic menu system. And when I say basic, it's incredibly simple. So for example, I can go into the SD card, I can see my files, but I can't like play them or anything. I can just sort of see that I have files. I can see some basic info about those files, when they were recorded, how big they are. We can adjust a few of the record settings, which nothing too spectacular there and we can go into system and change like the the date and the time auto power off you can you can format the card here which i don't want to do because i'm using it and now we're back on the f2 so you can hear the audio coming from this specifically so even though it is a little more expensive to get the bluetooth version i like the slightly added functionality of the app and depending on your workflow you might like it too the app is super basic Zoom is terrible at updating software and firmware, and this has been out for a while, so I have zero expectations that that's going to improve basically at all, ever. So that's probably as good as it's gonna get. But regardless of which version you choose to get, the basics are pretty much the same. The form factor is super small and lightweight. The recorder by itself is very light and plasticky feeling. Once you put the batteries in it, it has a little more weight to it. But you don't want, <laughs> you don't want a recorder like this to be super heavy because it's going to be clipped to stuff or put in somebody's pocket or whatever. So having it be lightweight, it's kind of important. So the front is pretty simple. You have some basic, you know, recording interfaces and your power button here, which is also your record button. And what I really like about this is it has a hold switch. So you turn it on, 
takes a second to boot up and then you hit record, you see the red light that lets you know it's recording and then you can switch it into hold which I have now and that means that none of the buttons are going to be active. So if you put it in somebody's pocket or something, it doesn't matter what they press or accidentally do, you can just flip on the hold switch and nothing will affect anything. The bottom of the front is the battery compartment door and then on the back you do have this metal clip which is removable if you don't need it or it's gonna get in the way. You do have the micro SD card slot here and it's a little bit tricky to get the card out. It's like not super convenient, but fortunately on the top, which I really like, the top is all brushed metal. And this is the thing with the Zoom products. Parts of them always feel like the flimsiest, cheesy, like Happy Meal toy quality. And then other parts are like, why did you make this military grade like super strong? I don't know. So the top of this really flimsy plastic recorder is super strong brushed metal, which looks great and is also just nice and durable and that's where you have both of your jacks, your input and your output which are locking jacks so they have threads on them you can lock in your microphones or your headphones which is great because you don't want a lavalier microphone to accidentally get disconnected and then you have a USB-C port here which you can run this off of USB power if you're needing it to run for a long time and since the micro SD card slot door is just a little janky that's the easiest way I have found to transfer files. You just connect this to your computer, it shows up like a drive, and then you can just drag and drop your files to wherever you need them. There is a pretty sizable discussion about file size with 32-bit float audio, and it is a little bit bigger than just a regular audio file that you would get from like a regular recorder, but I don't think it's too crazy. For me, what I've noticed is it's about a gigabyte per hour. Seems like what it is, which is fine. If you're somebody who shoots any kind of 4K or higher resolution video, I don't think you're gonna care about the file size of this audio because basically any audio file size is going to seem small in comparison to the super high resolution video files that you're dealing with regularly. So ultimately what you end up with is basically what seems like a wireless unit. You can clip it or put it in pockets, except you don't have to deal with any of the signal issues of a wireless unit. You always, at least I'm always a little bit worried about interference and signals dropping out. And then you have a transmitter and a receiver to make sure both are powered correctly. This you can press record and go miles away from the camera because it's its own separate recorder so it doesn't matter how far you are and you're still gonna get crystal clear audio. I don't think the extra work it takes to sync audio and post is that difficult. Some software, actually most software, has some different ways of automatically syncing audio for you but if you don't want to do that you can just clap, line up the audio spike from that clap with the visual of you clapping and then everything's gonna be in sync. So don't let the idea of an external recorder where you have to sync the audio discourage you from using it because the advantages super outweigh the disadvantages for sure. And speaking of advantages, let's talk about the biggest one, which is 32-bit float audio. Let's not float on by that in this discussion. Let's spend a bit of time talking about those bits. The thing about 32-bit float audio for me is that I avoided it for a long time because it sounded really confusing I didn't, it just seemed like something that was way beyond me and I was super wrong because it turns out it's actually really simple. So one thing you might have noticed missing on here is any kind of record input up or down levels. You don't adjust that at all. It only has record, start, stop, and that's it because that's all you need to do. You just press record and don't think about your levels at all. Basically, if things are way too loud, they're not going to clip. And if things are really quiet and you need to raise up the level, you shouldn't have a whole bunch of hiss and noise being introduced to that signal. I'll give you an example of that and here's a quick warning that things are gonna get a little bit loud for a moment. I'm going to switch between this 32-bit float audio and then non 32-bit float, the Sennheiser MKH-50 just running directly into my camera, just so you can see a difference. Again, we're not looking at the difference in quality between mics, we're just looking at the audio signal, the difference in audio signal. So for example, right now you're listening to the Sennheiser MKH-50 running directly into my Sony FX3 with the audio level set manually, and I'm talking really loudly, and it's probably clipping. The levels in Final Cut are yellow and red, and it sounds bad. There's nothing I can do to fix this audio in editing, but if we switch over to the 32-bit float audio, even though I'm talking loud like a crazy person, I can still bring those levels down and they're not going to be clipping as much. They should sound just fine. That was very uncomfortable, but hopefully it illustrated the point. Alternatively, let me turn this level way down. Here's the opposite of that. I haven't even changed the level of my voice. I'm talking into the microphone that's running into the FX3, but I've turned the audio really, really low. So this signal is way too low. And if I bring that up so you can hear what I'm saying, you're probably gonna notice a lot of hiss and noise. 
behind me because that non 32 bit signal has been raised up just super, super high. If I switch back over to the Zoom F2, it's going to sound fine because I'm talking at a normal volume. But now I talk really quietly where I'm not saying much. This might sound really uncomfortable because I'm whispering. But if I raise up this level, you shouldn't notice much hiss or noise. It should sound fine, even though the signal is really quiet. And now we'll go back to the normal audio. Sorry. Now, one thing that happens sometimes in these videos when I talk about a new piece of gear that I really like is people immediately ask if that means I've abandoned something else that I've talked about in the past. Like if I'm saying, wow, the Zoom F2 is amazing. Does that mean that the Rodecaster Pro is just a total piece of outdated junk? Yeah, throw it away. It's garbage. <laughs> no, of course that's not what that means. It's just really nice to have the right tool for the job. If I'm in here recording something where I have total control over everything, then I use the Rodecaster Pro for most of my XLR microphones because it's the best way to record those microphones. If I'm recording video, I usually run the MKH50 directly into my Sony FX3 just because then I don't have to sync audio even though it's not a huge hassle. If I can eliminate those few seconds, why not do that? And there's usually nothing crazy happening in this environment where levels are switching all over the place. But with a simple small recorder and 32-bit float audio, now I know I can use a lavalier microphone and I don't have to worry about the levels at all, which makes me a lot more confident in using them and opens up a lot more creative possibilities where I know I can get good audio in situations where it would have been really difficult before. So as much as I love 32-bit float audio and as much as I felt like the whole world was on board with it before I started Started trying it out since I've been using it I've then had people tell me if you really know what you're doing you don't need 32-bit audio because you're gonna get your levels right while you're recording and the jokes on them because I don't know what I'm doing most of the time but also I think that that's a really silly overgeneralization my own opinion when it comes to 32-bit float audio is that if you're using it as an excuse to not pay any attention to your audio and to totally slack it and be lazy, like you just wanna push a button and never think about anything and just sort of hope for the best and never improve your skills, that's probably a bad thing. But if you're using it as a way to free up brain power and resources to not have to worry about something or to help ensure that you get the best quality possible, then it's a really, really good thing. So where I think this really shines is in unpredictable audio situations or for somebody who has to pay attention to multiple production elements at once. So for example, I took the recorder to a hockey game just to try out the levels and things went from pretty loud to super loud, but the levels never clipped. And if you're somebody who's trying to focus on multiple things at once, like I'm thinking of wedding filmmakers or somebody who does client work where maybe you're setting everything up on your own, cameras, lighting, audio, you're trying to you know, get an interview with somebody, film some footage, and now you don't have to worry about your audio levels, that's a really big deal. If you're somebody who has to be in front of the camera and you work alone where you've had to set everything up and you're paying attention to audio levels and you're paying attention to try to communicate effectively on camera and convey all this information, not having to worry that your audio is set to just the right level is a really huge stress reliever. It just takes a huge weight off of your shoulders. So over the past few months, I've been trying to get better and better with lavalier microphones. Being able to use 32-bit audio in the Zoom F2 has been a total game changer because it takes that whole part out of it. And then all I need to focus on is getting better at understanding different lavalier microphones and different positioning and all that kind of stuff. But I know that no matter what, my audio levels are going to be just fine, which is absolutely amazing. And speaking of things that are absolutely amazing, thank you to everyone who helps support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. And just because I showed it a second ago, I do always get a lot of questions about the boom arm that the Rodecaster Pro 2 is on. It just has a vase amount in the back. So any generic arm will work. I was using a just a generic arm I found on Amazon, and now I'm using a different generic arm. But the difference with this one is that it's super duper long. So this is kind of new actually for my setup, but it can go so long and it can collapse. And that means here, or I guess better yet here, if I want to do something with the Rodecaster, I can actually easily have it in the shot with me. And it's really cool if I do Rodecaster tutorials, I can position this somewhere where the camera can be filming it and I can be using it and it's not like this awkward situation. So if you've got a Rodecaster Pro 2 but you've never put it on a, some kind of articulating arm, it's great. And then it totally gets off your desk and frees up a lot of space. Totally recommend it. Any VESA arm will work. So I hope that arms you with good information about arms. Wait, this video wasn't about arms.